Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Mythical Ireland Library. I'm Anthony Murphy. This is Live Irish Myths in Conversation. Tonight we have episode 14 and a very special guest in the form of Ongoa Tom King. I was planning uh, to... Um, we were planning to live stream this episode from Tom's Forge. However, we did a test live stream uh, a week back uh, or so and found that the um, the internet just wasn't quite allowing things to happen the way we wanted them to. We are streaming live on facebook.com uh, forward slash mythical Ireland and youtube.com forward slash mythical Ireland. Um, so I'm not going to say hello to people tonight. That's because we recorded this episode on Saturday, two days ago at Tom's Forge. So it's a live recording. It's basically unedited except for the, uh, the editing between the clips. Uh, I haven't taken anything out, even the couple of moments where I make a fool of myself. But anyway, that's all good. That's all good. Um, so what I will be doing is I'm going to play the video. I will be here. I'll be interacting with you on the chat. I will occasionally interject with comments, uh, like uh, vocal, audible comments. Uh, but the main thing is that we get underway because this video is two, two hours and three quarters, two hours, 45 minutes. It's a long one, but I think you've, you'll find... And I hope that you will find uh, that you will be very uh, relaxed and that the time will fly for you. Anyway, uh, so we talk about Tom's work and his inspiration. We talk about our very special announcements. Hang around for those. Then we go to the forge and we try to see if Anthony can make a swan spiral pendant like those of the master forger himself. <sighs> Let's see if that can happen. Anyway, um, I'm hoping that Tom is here. Um, I'm sure he will make himself known in the comments shortly. In the meantime, sit back, make yourselves comfortable, and get ready for what I hope you will agree is a, a very enjoyable... <laughs> uh, I have to show Joan's comment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll have a five o'clock shadow before this is over. <laughs> anyway, good evening to everybody. As I say, I'm not going to say hello individually because I just want to get the show underway. It's a long, two and two hours, 45 minutes. And uh, look, I'll keep chatting with you on the chat. And occasionally I'll pause the video and come on here and just if, if there's a comment or two to be made. And I will show your comments uh, uh, also. Uh, the clean version of the video without all of this will also be available on YouTube afterwards. So anyway, here we go. Here we go. I hope Tom is in the house. Anyway, Tom, I'm not seeing you there just yet. I hope you're with us with us, and uh, that you will be able to interact uh, this evening um, with uh, uh, any of the commenters. I will be doing that here on Facebook and YouTube. I just have to make sure that I keep the volume down on the old tube out here. No, in fact, I won't stream that. I'll probably mostly interact on here. So Grant, enjoy yourselves. This is Live Irish Myths in conversation with Tom King on Goa. And uh, enjoy. I'm going to mute myself now and uh, bring up the video. Um, actually, I could. Good afternoon, Tom. Good afternoon, Anthony. <laughs> We're here in your forge in the heart of the Boyne Valley on a lovely late winter day. It kind of feels like spring is yeah. in the air, doesn't it? Correct. Lovely mild day. And we're here to talk about your work and uh, a few other things. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we should start, as I always do, by asking you 
to tell us first of all about your origins yes you know and you know your upbringing and you know uh perhaps lead into then you know how you first became interested in the creative area that you ended up in absolutely anthony yeah i mean we're, we're located here in the village of Bohemian, which is the, the Irish for smooth roads. So that's quite a significant uh, little village itself regarding the old or the ancient uh, road to Tara. So this, the Bohemian school is only down the road here where we, uh, where we were schooled there for the very young age. And at that there, there was always that, uh, the, you know, the, the curiosity of the making and the creating and drawing. So that seed was very well planted at a very early stage there. And of course, you know, having been brought up on a farm, you know, you had that uh, space to express that creativity and uh, the, the, the freedom, so to speak. Yeah. So uh, we're always, you know, mechanically minded, you know, making things, innovating situations and circumstances there in and around farm machinery and all that. So that 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 was always the case from a very early age. Brilliant. And uh, you said the smooth road. Yes. And tell us about how that connects with Tara. How far away is the hill of Tara from, from here? From the village of Bohemian, it's about a, it's about a 12, 15 minute drive. So yeah. it's literally down the road. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, Bohemian, the smooth road, was one of the five smooth roads in the old calendar that led the Northern Territories to the Sacred Hill for ceremony and all that that wow. went with the Hill of Tara. So it's pretty special. The actual road outside of the farm here is called the Well Road for the obvious wells there's two wells there's a well right across the road from where we sat here and another well there about a mile and a half up the road here and again the old people of the village the very old people they in their lifetime said in all their years and all the dry summers never seen it dry so it's an incredible thing when you can see the well and how it just survives so it's obviously got that special relationship with the with the village and back in the day again yeah. when it did serve obviously for all those years yeah and are are there names on the wells do you know there's just it's just a limestone uh, flag across it and uh, the effort has been made then just to protect the actual surrounding from cattle or animals getting in to upset the stonework yeah but you know it did it, it's always been respected yeah of course wells are very uh, i mean there's a great history of wells sacred wells in correct. ireland yeah a lot of them have saints names correct but they were probably christianized at some <clears> point and some of these wells were sources of clean water Correct. right back yeah. through history and maybe even into prehistory as yeah. well. And it's nice that you're always you're conscious of your sort of home oh, with territory yes. and your roots and the Correct. stories around it. Correct. Because there's a distinct story here too at your home place yeah. connecting with the famine, isn't there? A kind Correct. of a sad story, really. There is isn't indeed. There? Yes, during the hungry years, as we like to call it, because the famine is another very debatable discussion when you go into the, the, the bones of it, so to speak. So during those hungry years, the local town in Navan, when they, they could not cope with the numbers, what they did was they, they suggested that the local house here that was on the land was called Robertstown House a big old listed building, you know, a grand old stone dwelling. Yeah. At the time then it was suggested that they were going to lease it. So they rented it out, <clears throat> whatever shillings a week for whatever reason or whatever the, the sum was. And it became then Durhamstown Auxiliary Workhouse. So that was the go to when the local workhouse in Navan became full. There was no more room. So again, the locals, you know, all the unfortunates that had no other option. They would have walked up this back avenue here to the farm. They would have swung right along the woodland, entered another stout woodland, and another 10-minute walk then right up to the the workhouse. Yeah. And that's where they, they, they sought refuge and, and, and food. And, of course, at that time, I, I mean, I don't have a huge knowledge of the famine, but yeah. I understand that the workhouses were all full. Correct. And that it was difficult to get into any of them. Extremely difficult, time. yeah. In fact... There is a road now, if, 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 if you came here now in the twilight of the evening, if you could see the lights through the woods there, that's uh, the New Line Road. It's another road going from Navan to Bormean. It's about two and a half, three mile long, straight as a rifle shot. That was actually a, a penal project where the occupants of the house were sent to their work every day because the funding came from England to say, well, we'll give you the funding, but here's the tools and go and construct roadways or whatever other projects that's needed in the local area. So it wasn't a matter of just giving them the relief. They had to earn it. So, so they were working They for were food. working for their food, yeah. And God help them, they were probably wretched and Absolutely, starving. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there was a local historian here, a man by the name of Pat Travers. He was always coming to our farm every summer just to come for a walk to visit the workhouse. And the stories that Pat would explain, you know, he, he mentioned one time 
they, when they baked the bread, they would never give it to them straight away because it was too fresh. It right. had to be a week or a week and a half old before you would get your slice of bread because then while you consume that slice, you know, you just kind of held that notion until you were hungry enough to go for another one rather than eat too much too soon. Wow. Well, it was so, fresh. So they were basically much. eating stale bread. Correct and right, yeah. Wow, as yeah. a means of just slowing them. Correct. Yeah. If it was fresh, to eat it too quickly and eat it eat too much. Yeah. We yeah. were talking before the cameras were rolling there about um, uh, our a favourite movie of ours, The yes. Field. Yeah. And you spoke about a very poignant scene that uh, touched me also. And that was the scene, you, t you tell the story, but that was the scene in the church where the priest is after reading them from the pulpit and yes. running them out of the church Correct. and closing the gates on Yes, them. That, that, you know, at that point of the film, the priest almost takes the authority on himself and to lecture the congregation there, you know, to say, well, somebody has news but is not saying it. So we blame everybody. So everybody, please leave the, the church or the chapel. And everybody's a little annoyed with that, you know. You know, you can imagine the, the ladies and the children very upset having to leave God's house under the instruction of the priest. And as everyone exits the, you know, the, the, the church and the, the chapel gate, the gates are closed. And of course, the great Bull McCabe comes up with that great quote, you know, he's, as he said himself, you know, no priest died during the famine. Yeah. Which is an incredible statement when you think, yeah. you know, everybody has to suffer, you know. So why should those, you know, that in a little bit of authority, a little bit of power, be better off than those who had nothing? Yeah. And, and uh, Richard Harris, uh, an absolutely Legend. fantastic absolutely performance. Brilliant. brilliant. The if you haven't seen the field, uh, definitely you must see the field starring Richard Harris and John Hurt and Sean Bean and Francis Tomlety. Brilliant, brilliant movie. Yeah. Might might just add here that you know we're costumed up today, Tom, <laughs> and he has the whole Bull McCabe look about him, doesn't he? <laughs> you can nearly imagine him with a stick in his hand, you know, saying you'll sell no for me. <laughs> but um. Yeah, we're 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 in we're in costume. We are, yeah. Tell tell, tell the viewers yeah. a little bit about the costume and, of course, the furniture well, and yeah. the setting. Well, part of the visit or the experience to the Bohemian and on Gaba, you know, I I do make an effort. I like to create. If you if you use your imagination at all and just cast your mind back, all those years back to the two of the Dana, the Sacred Hill of Tara, the festivities, the banquets, mm -hmm. you know, the celebrations, the living, yeah. enjoying the life. And why not at the forge? A similar encounter, bring it back to basics, a little bit of fun, a little bit of creativity. And you know what, it's, 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 a, it's a very enjoyable encounter. And you know, it creates that atmosphere. It creates it this personality and uh, it's very enjoyable. And I yeah. get a lot of fun out of it. I think this is the first time I've done an interview in costume. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I really love the chair, Well, Tom. do you know what, behind and you here now, I have to say now, and a big shout out to Sean Fitzgerald here because uh, really, really f uh, thanks to Sean here because uh, I'm a huge fan of Sean's work. Very inspirational, you know, as a maker of metal and all creativity regarding woodwork or anything like that, I get my stimulus, I get my excitement from the Courtney Davises, the Jim Fitzpatricks and the Sean Fitzgeralds. And Sean's chair is behind you here where this is the, the, the Lou chair. If in, in one of uh, Sean's images there on the Battle of Moitura, he has the young Lou sa sat there with the crown of spears and the crown of swords. And I think that's an incredibly powerful, powerful in image. So again, a little bit of creativity yeah, and look, we, we've got the throne. So And, uh, and this beautiful spiral yes. uh, as well, which, how is that finished? There's a lovely sheen off that. Well, what I've done is uh, I've, 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 sc I've scrolled it up. I've used my, my forge here and, and then I, what I've done is uh, I've, g I've given it a, a colour black and then I've come with a clear coat uh, lacquer, a two-pack lacquer, just to give it a little lovely. bit of shine. And, and uh, so I have my spear. <laughs> Uh, not exactly sure what this is for. <laughs> Certainly not for use on him. Uh, this is just in case we get any uh, intruders. Un unwanted intruders. <laughs> <laughs> but um, brilliant. And this is another correct of things that you made. Yes, yeah. But I'm I'm very excited to start going down the road of the, the the spears and the blades and the swords and the shields. Again, that that mythical past where at one time, if you can imagine and picture the scene where the great Finn went to, to battle and, you know, the great warrior and all the stories that goes with that. You can imagine the, the, the conversation he had mm. with Ongaba at the time, you know, where he came back and just maybe critiqued the blade. Yeah. That broke when it shouldn't have broken. Yeah. Or here's the new or the latest blade or the latest dragon slaying sword or whatever. So again, there's a, an interesting conversation with the maker and the creator, with the great queens and the kings and the, and, and the warriors. So... It's all a bit of fun. Well, it's great that you're inspired by the mythology too. But anyway, before we get on to that, we need to yeah. talk about 
How and when did you actually first smith and did you yeah. first realize that not only could you work with metal but yeah. that you enjoyed it and you could see yourself Correct. creating yeah. is that well long ago or? long ago in a sense of the creating and the innovativeness that's absolutely given there's no there's no you know f- f- fault or dare there for, for want of a better description but the direction of where i could because i'm a design engineer by trade right i'm schooled in the art of agricultural design engineer so that's my bread and butter but again it's a similar kind of thought when you have a problem you create a concept an idea it goes into R&D research and development you develop the concept you bring it to production so that kind of all those gears or that mechanically minded you know aspect of it then started coming to the creativity on the artwork and how it can express that innovativeness of the creative thinking in regards an artwork now we're very blessed as I mentioned to you before there, where we're located in the Boyne Valley. Mm. We've got the ancient East, uh, you know, the heritage, the, all that goes with that. And again, if we pick up any book or the literature or the great work you've been working on, Anthony, there regarding the excitement of the stimulus of the ancient stories. And if you can start putting some uh, meaningful art with that to create, all of a sudden I have the spirals, I have the pendants, I have the torques. I have yeah. the swords, I have the spears. So they become real. They, they're, they're no longer an image on the book. They've become crafted and they become real. And there's a lot of enjoyment in that because you've got a story association with your heritage, with the people who have gone before us. So if we think of the Boyne Valley now and think of all the artists and the creators in the Boyne Valley, Huge and amount, you ask yeah. them people, what's your stimulus? What gets you excited? Every one of them will have different answers. And I'm sure a lot of people will say, yeah, the ancient East, the ancient past and the myth and legend that goes with that, that gets me excited. And it's a tremendously exciting platform and a stimulus. There's so much information there and there's so much excitement. Again, you could go to the National Museum and you look behind this glass oh, and you just look at all the chances and the, the brochure. the most incredible thing? And they're absolutely exquisite. It's just amazing. So you can yeah. imagine the hands that put that together yes, yeah, and yeah. the tools they've used, the techniques they've used, the, 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 you know, the painful process of a very slow creativity from start to finish and the, the you know the response they would have got from that it would have been incredible so you you in a in a, in a sense or in essence yeah you worked in agricultural machinery design correct and manufacture correct yes and and so the set of skills that you learned there yes. you just transferred those to correct. the creative sphere yes so a lot of what you learned in that industry served you well then yes. as an artist it, it, yeah because it, it almost acts as the cornerstone for the wall it gets you started it gives you a platform because art always have to have has a meaning there has to be the question of why and you always want to provoke the thought and create that you know that item that you know someone will look at and appreciate yeah. And uh, when you have story behind that, then the mechanics are to be able to make that comes to play behind it. But it's what you see as a finished article that you can say, well, right, I know I understand the association of what you've done and the background behind that. Again, there's so much information there and so much exciting. And I suppose artwork. it gives you an idea of what kind of metals Correct. can be worked Correct. in particular ways. Correct. Correct. What sort of, I suppose, the cost of metals Correct. is. Yes. Um, and then the sort of machinery that you would need but you don't yeah. use a lot of machinery in what you do don't you not so there's a machinery in some aspect of it but most of it is handwork yeah yeah which because, is brilliant well that yeah because it gives us the finesse of it it gives you the style it gives you the finish it gives you that personality in the steel itself tell me when when did you first make something in in the blacksmith as a smith yeah oh i, I reckon about 10 12 years ago and 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 what did you make and how did it feel and how did it give you an introduction to, hang on a second, there's a whole world of creativity? Yes, here. you see, I also wood turn as well, and I, I've, wood t- I've made some of my wood turning tools. Again, being an innovative, again, I see uh, springs from old lorries or car springs. I can reinvent those because they're a high carbon steel. So I, again, I read up on the smiths and how they anneal the metal, they can shape the metal, harden and temper. And all of a sudden, once I go through that process, then I have a tool that's a very useful item, and it's made literally from scrap. I don't have to go to the high street or spend money to say, yeah. well, I can buy a high-speed steel. Well, why would I be doing that? I have all this steel available there. It's just a matter of go and forge it, harden and temper it, put a handle on it, and I have a very useful tool. It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, yeah. to be able to create something beautiful from yeah. something that maybe somebody looks at and goes, that's a piece of scrap. That's yes. worthless. Correct. But in your eyes, it's never worthless. It, you know? The Smith was always the case. They, 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 they always had that incredible innovativeness to be able to say, right, 
here's the problem and here's the solution without going to uh, you know the ends of the earth regarding having to go and buy expensive machinery or whatever they, they were able to make and innovate and, and you know all the all the great you know a lot of the great machinery manufacturers there like John Deere they all were great smiths back in the day when they started off with the plough and the farm implements there but very primitive but they still innovated away and look where they are now you know i suppose you don't have to go too far back in history to a time when there were a lot of blacksmiths correct for instance for horse shoes etc etc yeah. I, I know there's a smithing in my wife's family for okay. instance uh, yeah. i think her great grandfather was a blacksmith right um so at one point they were like the filling station of today yes. you pull in to get your petrol correct. or the tire place or yes. whatever or the yeah. wheel balancing place correct but yeah. if you go back maybe a century or a century and a half yeah there's smiths everywhere yeah uh do you know was were, were there smiths in your family uh, not that I know of, no. Yeah, so this is sort of a new thing for yes, you. Yes, But you must have felt, uh, uh, you know, when you s started out, as you say, 10 or 12 years ago, yeah. you must have felt that, wow, you know, that there was something in this that was just uh, inherently natural for you. Correct, that, you absolutely. Know, this is, you see, what, I can do this and at, I can, yeah, you know. At, at that time and as we developed, all of a sudden we became aware of the Instagrams and then the Facebooks and all of a sudden you're connecting to a world of people of a similar frequency. And you're looking at other great smiths and look at the work they're doing and look at how people can connect with them. And you get excited then because you know then there's a possibility it can become sustainable. So that's the next biggest challenge is to make it become sustainable and then try and sail your own ship. And luckily I'm, I'm, I'm able to manage that now. I'm only in my early days, but it's still very exciting now. So for a long time you were just making things yeah. and you weren't commercial. No. You're, you weren't selling them. Correct. You were probably giving some of them away. Oh, yeah. And, Absolutely. And, and that uh, was training ground as well, I'm sure. Big learning lesson. Yeah. Big learning lesson. Because so you make, make something wrong, and, yeah. and you make something wrong once, yeah. and then you correct it and correct. as you're going along. Every day is a learning day. There yeah. is no doubt about it. No matter who or what you are, every One day is a learning day. One of my great you know, philosophies correct. in life. Yeah. Like, no matter what, or what you're doing or whatever level you think you're at, every day is a learning day. And the, the, the secret is to be able to learn from mistakes. The biggest skill I learned during the engineering days was to recover from disappointment, to understand disappointment. Like if you see a child play with a stack of Lego and you have a toddler building a stack so tall, they'll build it once and it'll fall over. Yeah. They'll build it twice, it'll fall over. They'll build it three times, fall over. Next is the tantrum. There's the spread of the legs, there's the kick of the thing away, there's a big whale. <laughs> now, if you consider that now in modern day design, We'll say, right, well, why did it go wrong in the first place? Why did it go wrong in the second place? What lessons are we learning all the time? There's a chance it can go wrong, but let's not let's reduce that chance by doing whatever yeah. it needs to do. And all of a sudden you're learning all the time. Like, I remember when I was in uh, the design engineer and, uh, in, in Drummond Engineering, it was an incredible lesson to, to send uh, 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 in a design for a test where there could be two million cycles. If it failed at a million and a half, well, we're not there, but we're getting there. Yeah. And then there's a discussion on the improvements we need to make to the next prototype. Go and make them and then test it. Now, if you fail at, you know, 19, you know, very close to the, to the, to the, the pass line, it's a discussion then of getting you across the line because then you've engineered it very well. Yeah. You haven't over-engineered it, but you're at the point where yeah. it's an acceptable and a certificate can be issued. And that's a good place to be. So that's the whole thing about learning from disappointment. Brilliant. And that's the same with the, with, the, with the Smith work, you know. Not everything works, but whatever works, you've learned from it by f learning from failures. And if it has worked, Correct. you can also... It's a, it's, it's a celebration. You can improve upon it. Then, of course it can, yeah. You know. but, but once, if you have an idea and the concept is there, prove it and get to the point where you say, right, okay, it actually works. And, and you know, it's a great place to be because it may have taken two or three efforts, but you've never given up. You've never stopped trying. You've got to keep trying keep at it yeah and it can be said for many things in life a great philosophy <laughs> so tom you were telling us there that you weren't just working with metal that you Correct. also work with wood and i thought this was the perfect opportunity to show off uh, thank you so some much. of your work um tell us a little bit about this these both creations that seem to go together yes i, I call this piece the megalithic man of Loch crew so again, you have to kind of picture the context of the actual uh, surrounding, you know, the burial chambers, Carabon East and all the associated hills. Again, burial passages. So you kind of imagine, right, OK, what would that have looked like back then there where the remains would have been brought to the Sacred Hill? 
would have been left then for the wildlife to re remove the flesh and then the bone would have been taken and fired and then placed into the cairn itself or the vessel to enter the next world as they believed so again it's 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 almost a replication there where including your own good work where we can see the passage tombs and we can see the vessels it's almost a centerpiece of the actual cairn itself where the whole purpose of that womb like entrance ended up at a vessel where the where the where the, where the ash would have been laid mm. so they would have had their time and passed to the next world this piece is a, a piece of bog oak this is the bowl. Yes. We'll, we'll take out... Have you given him a name? Yorick. <laughs> Yorick. Oh, I'm only kidding. Yeah, I mean, it just came to me there, you know. But well, we'll talk about him in a moment. Yes. But but this is bog oak. That's correct. That's So bog oak is what, for people who don't know? Bog oak is oak that has rested in a bog over many, many years. In some cases, thousands. Thousands. Yeah. I've had a piece analysed from that particular slab there, and it's between three and three and a half thousand years old. Wow. Yes. And it has been taken or extracted from the local bog in Bohemian here, where when the summer comes, um, you know, the, 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 the peat extraction with the excavators, they unearth large pieces of oak, which becomes a bit of a nuisance to those workers who say no we don't want this it's in our way can someone remove it and of course i just jumped at the opportunity when i got a phone call would you like some bog oak i said absolutely brilliant so i was delighted with that uh, 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 and uh, the, the 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 oak is sorry <laughs> get your thoughts together anthony the oak is preserved correct by the bog yes it doesn't rot no the, 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 in bog, the way that it would if it was just lying out in the correct. open it just creates that sealed chamber wow. once there's no air or oxygen entering the the cavity itself it remains as it is now the piece itself i always look at a piece of bog oak and i, I try my best to write so right what can we do with this without taking any more than i need to Excuse for me. example this piece here all I wanted to do was shape the outside of it, as you see with that shape, and I wanted to shape the inside of it, as you see with that shape. It's lovely, smooth, concave No, shape, No yeah. more material taken up, because there's no point in putting this in a lathe, working it, and it ends up in dust at your feet, yeah. and it's swept up and it's thrown in the pan. That's waste. So you have to respect that piece of material, the oak that has rested for so many years in that cavity, that no one is working it and making it into something, making it into a vessel, making a piece of art. And I mean, when you when you look at it, and I mean, it's very interesting when you see the end grain, what story that can tell of that tree, which is aged between three and three and a half thousand years and, old. And can I ask you, how was it dated? Was it through the tree rings? It was a, a, a sample and carbon dated. Oh, in, carbon yes, dated. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I know we, we've spoken on Live Irish Myths to Mike Bailey, yes. dendrochronologist. Okay. And we have a, a bog oak record that going back is at 7,000 okay. years, yeah. showing us the various climatic events that Correct. have happened. And yeah. So w w this is amazing. This is a piece of wood from the local bog. Correct. That it was growing that that was last growing in the Bronze Age. Right. This is this is this is a piece of Bronze Age wood Correct. right here. Yeah. So what we're seeing in the rings yes. are those years of growth. Correct. When the sun was shining and the summers came and went three to three and a half thousand years. Correct. That's incredible. And the pattern of the rings themselves, they're all very, very close together. Okay. With a bar exception, there's a, a you know, there's a section there which is quite wide between the rings, which suggests very poor summers oh i can see that now you're not going to be able to see that on the camera but i can yeah. see here where the rings are very tightly yes. packed here bad, which means yeah. what does that mean it's bad growth a yeah. bad summer bad summers yeah. little very little growth correct so this piece of wood tells us something about the climate in which it was growing correct and uh, so how did you create such a smooth object H how is this done you didn't turn it on a lathe oh that's it? on the lathe yes oh, it was done correct. on a lathe yes but you have to be very careful Extremely. because this has there's a big crack in the middle of it correct. presumably this is wood that could fragment correct. at any moment so. very very possible you got to assess the, the, the project before you even start getting it ready for the lathe at the end of the day, nobody wants an accident. You have to have the experience call and say, right, OK, I want to turn it. How am I going to do that? I think I generated a strap for that to create stability so that I have confidence to be able to present the wood turning tooling and shape it as I shaped it. Otherwise, you're just dealing with a loaded gun that if that thing flew off, it can be a very nasty experience. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 And That's it's quite brittle. It, 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 yes, it, I can imagine. It's, it's a very dirty 
timber to work with. It's almost like a coal texture. Right. There's no shaving as such. It's just all fragments. It's and it small. looks black. Had it got that natural black in Correct. it? Or did you have to colorize it? No, no, well? that's natural. The oil that's on that there at the minute is just bringing that real black out, which is a that magnificent is, black. It is beautiful. Yeah. It is the most beautiful thing. And so, I mean, I'm just asking, but, you know, if people were interested, would you be interested in, in, in taking commissions to, to make wooden objects? Oh, absolutely, yeah. But when you present it with a slab of bog oak that has that age, that's, uh, that's my number one piece of art. Yeah, it's beautiful. And, uh, I have to say, you know, if you go 20, 30 years turning bowls and turning work, Stephen there on, on, on the mythical, I, I can, I'm sure he can appreciate that as well. To get a piece of bog oak and to turn it and to conquer the challenge mm. and come out the other end with a piece that you can just say, leave it at that now, let the oil finish it and let it sit, you can walk away very satisfied. I, I, I tell you, I, I, I mean, just I, I can imagine there are lots of people who would want to have a piece, you know, uh, as an ornament in their home yeah. there's something natural organic rough and ready about it Correct. but there's something extraordinarily beautiful and powerful Absolutely. about it as well it's the there? time you know yeah. when, when we when we put a when we look at time and context it's very easy to say three thousand years three and a half thousand years but what does that feel like what does that what is that when you think of how long well, that what's the average is. lifespan? I mean, not yeah. the maximum lifespan. The yeah. average lifespan now is probably yeah. around 50 years. Correct. So you're talking 7,000 generations. Correct. Am, Am I right? right? <laughs> no, I mean... Oh, oh hang on, the, Anthony. The maths is so bad the, here. I apologise. <laughs> three and a half thousand like divided by 50 is 7,000, isn't it? Brain freeze. Yeah, because if you divide it by one... No, no sorry. It's uh, a big number. No, uh, <laughs> we might have to cut that bit because I just can't do the maths very ancient tell us about let's call him um i have a name for him <laughs> leo nithic <laughs> do you like that Love it. leo nithic very let, good let, let's talk about your skull because this is a uh, uh this is carved from a single piece Correct. of wood Presum it's actually from my own forest here is this what kind of timber is this elm that's elm irish elm wow yes and it has got the irish elm disease in it on the right hand side there wow and how did you i mean the outside of the skull is smooth. Correct. And the inside, I can actually see where, with some sort of a chisel or yes. an awl, that you've carved out Correct. the inside of it. Correct, yeah. How much work was involved oh, in that? Oh, there's definitely a week's work in that. Yeah. Four or five days, yeah. I mean, the carving of it there on day three, I'm certainly on the, on the back end of the carving. And then the finishing of it. If it's badly finished, it looks shocking. If it's well finished, it's worthwhile then. Yeah. So the finishing is absolutely critical. It's, it's unfortunately it's a slow process and it's you know you respect that you can't yeah, you can't yeah. you got to just work with it there and i mean you, you you start off with the grits of paper and you end up with a 320 or 500 grit paper just to get it really well finished and then the oil can take to it the timber can absorb that and it really comes up very well there's a lovely patina on that nearly almost nearly. so the paper is like sandpaper correct and it's on a roller or what's that called it's well like it's just uh, sanding paper yeah but the machine no it's all done by hand oh wow yeah, yeah. So, yeah. no, again, no machinery involved. No, this because is, uh, when I, if, I, if I was to put a machine to that, oh, it's just, it actually do more damage than good. It and, has to be done by hand. And you've created these sort of eye sockets and the lips on them. I mean, yes. is that just down again to sanding? And Oh, well, the carving was, uh, would, would have broken. You did the carving the first. But there's a purpose with that now. And I remember a good friend of mine there, Ollie Burns there, I'll never forget it there. I had a, an art exhibition there with the Coke Club of Oldcastle there, the Creative Outlets. And I brought this piece to it, and Ollie was really impressed with it there. And he, he, he I never forget what he said. He said, uh, it's a thought-provoking piece. And I remember when I sat out the design of the skull, I said, right, if I make a skull, it's going to be a skull. But can I give it a little bit more of an edge that will almost give a fear factor, where it's quite aggressive, there's almost something there that just kind of puts the hair standing in your head. And that's what I did. I give it a, quite an aggressive uh, side here, the same with the, you know, the the additional bone if you want over the eye sockets yeah. now someone will say there's no such thing as that and I'll say absolutely fine there's no problem with that yeah. all it is is an imagination it's a work of art it's, it's a work yeah. it's yeah. a creative and, work and, and again the whole idea is remembering the cairns and what happened inside you know you can visit them, them places with the greatest of respect but you can almost become you know just kind of falsely alluded to what actually happened there because yeah. it was quite barbaric if you think mm -hmm. about it. You can imagine a loved yeah. one left on a scaffolding there for the wildlife to, re to remove the flesh for two or three weeks. 
that would have been a horrific thing to be seen, never mind to be actually being part of it. And then there was the time where they gathered all the bones and they fired the bones and they placed it inside on the, in the tomb and in, on the vessel. That was every day, this was part of the yep. ritual. But yet, in today's context, that's shocking. Yes. But this is what happened. But for them, it was natural. It was natural. It's, it, it's not glamorous, that's not for glamorous. sure. Uh, I think about, you know, that recent uh, DNA study of yeah. the, the man who, whose skull fragments were um, genomically uh, tested and uh, in Newgrange. Yeah. You know, and, and that even at the point where they retrieve the bones from, yeah. the, from the elevated platform or the scaffold and they cremate them, yeah. there's, there, there's a further breaking down that Correct. takes place because an awful lot of the bones found in Irish passage tombs were very small, small Correct. fragments. And as you say, they were sort of close to the whole process of treating the dead. Yes. Whereas today we just hand them over to an undertaker who dresses them up and puts makeup on, puts them in a coffin. Yeah. And and sort of, it's not that they're trying to amorise death, but it's just that we are very removed from it Correct. now. You know, that in prehistory, they were obviously very, very close to the dead. Yes. Very different way of yeah. dealing with things. Treating the dead and how they died. When you look at the evidence there of a, a sword strike or flint arrows or whatever, it would have been quite horrific too. There would have been mm. no hold back there. There would have been decapitation. Even the recent talk on the goddess Bowen. What was that word we discussed? Dismemberment. Dismemberment. What is that? Shocking. Yeah. It really is. It really that is there was incredible. Actually, there were practitioners in the Neolithic. No. We'll, we'll call them Neolithic undertakers. But yeah. there were practitioners who, when somebody died, they had to dismember them correct uh, and they had to put them on platforms and yeah. they had to retrieve the bones and they yeah. had to do the cremations yeah. and yeah yeah we would think nasty stuff but for them you know it was an yeah. entirely different thing so yeah. uh, this is um something that's inspired by by prehistory correct. and what's there in the archaeological record it yes. is a most incredible piece of work <laughs> and uh, and it just goes to show how um versatile you are in terms of you know well, the materials I've, that you use i've been blessed to be able to do and while you are able to do one goes and do yeah <laughs> i mean it's, it's a very simple logic so when i can enjoy doing it and again again lock crew anthony it's half an hour down the road from here beside us so again we're smack bang in the middle of all these incredible sites and we're born and reared with it and it's a blessing yeah, I it's often an thought, thing. and I've said it many a time, that I'm very lucky to live uh, four miles as the crow flies from Newgrange and to live in a place where you're only you're no more than an hour away from pretty much, not all, but a great deal of the sacred uh, and holy uh, and monumental Correct. sites of history and Correct. prehistory. Yeah. Like, when you live in the Boyne Valley, you are, in essence, in the centre of a huge archaeological park Correct. that extends for, you know, dozens of miles in each direction, yeah. but which has all of this wonderful treasure trove, Correct. not just in the material, of course, yeah. but also then in the cultural, in in the, the mythology and the folklore and the legends that we derive so much pleasure from retelling and yeah. that we also derive so much uh, I suppose creative uh, juice from as Correct. it were yeah. and you're very conscious of that I know stimulus huge absolutely I mean that's what the, there's where the excitement is there's where the there's where the sparks are pardon the point it's almost know. like the boin is flowing through your veins I'm, I'm, I'm representing the past makers and you know I'm very conscious of that of the creatives of the innovators and here we are in this day and age with all the technology we have yeah. if we can keep a connection with the old just to keep it Keep it alive. Keep working their hands. Don't forget that, you know, these are important as much as the smart devices. You know what I mean? Wouldn't so. it be a fascinating thing to go back in time? Incredible. To yeah. the Bronze Age. Yes. To when this oak was Stubbed perhaps home. growing. Yeah. And to meet I mean, some so, of the early smiths. You know, when you think about it, you know, it started off life as a small oak. Yeah. You know, and all of a sudden time again passes on. It started off life as an acorn. Correct. Yes. A tiny little seed, yes. as it were. Yeah. And so the seeds have definitely been planted in this man's <laughs> mind and definitely um, sp uh, sp sprouting uh, green shoots. Yeah. Um, but I wonder what it would be like to be at a smelting forge for the early bronze makers. Incredible. That, yeah. I'm sure that would yeah. be fascinating. Tremendous. I'm so see how they dealt with the difficulties that they had. I'm, I'm so excited that at some point during the forge, the, the blacksmith career, there will be the point where I can smelt 
and I can cast a bronze. I can cast a brass. Wow. That's a level a little bit above me at the minute, but mm. we're on the stepping stones to it. If I'm making the, the hilt for a sword or the, the handguard, you know, I can cast it and then I can f f do the finer details. So that's all part of the vocabulary and it's a tremendously exciting future when you think about that's inv what it, that involves. It's brilliant just to think about the possibilities because yeah. at the moment, let's be honest, it's rather convenient for you that yeah. you have sources, raw material Correct. sources, whether it be wood or whether yes. it be metal. Correct. Those are relatively convenient because Correct. of the modern world we live in. Correct. I mean, for instance, yeah. scrap metal, which is something you make great use of, yeah. is available in abundance. But of course, back then, there was no garage that you could go to and say, give us a couple of old lorry springs or, you know, bits of cars. Yeah. Back then, you, uh, you had to actually, I mean, the first thing you had to do yeah. was take the ore out of the ground. Correct. Uh, I Make mean, the bloom. it boggles it does. the mind, doesn't it? Correct. To think of the challenges yes. that they had. Absolutely. Yeah. And the wondrous yeah. things they yeah. were able to create yeah. as a result. I mean, I, I, I think Irish art really perfected and reached a zenith in the Iron Age and, and the early medieval period, when you have the likes of the Tower of Brooch, yeah. when you have the likes of the Book of Kells, when you, when you see that these generations of skill and knowledge have come to the point, this apex, Correct. where the most extraordinarily exquisite things are being created. Yes, yes yeah. Yeah. And you yeah, can yeah, do yeah. nothing but stand back in yeah. admiration of them. Correct, yeah. You know? I mean, their, 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 their termination their ability to run with a task that was absolutely heartbreaking, you know, a slow, tedious, painstaking mm. task, not a word of complaint, go and do, and that was it. Yeah. That was just immerse themselves in a, in a completely different world. And I think there's a lot to be said for that, you know, when you think about what, what the time that they worked in, but yet they were so content, they were so happy. And yet we look at a lot of modern society now, and there's a lot of upset, there's a lot of anxieties, a lot of, where there's a disconnect, Whereas if you can start hauling those people into, into, into an environment there to just, you know, find out for yourself, enjoy a making of some description, there's a lot of, there's a tremendous amount of enjoyment from that. Yeah, I often think that the people of the past, and you only have to go back a couple of centuries, but people of the past, the pre-industrial era, yeah. were very resilient in many yeah. respects because they had to make their own food, they had to grow and make their own food and they had to make their own clothes. They had to make all of the things that they used as implements and furniture and everything Correct. else yes. and their own homes. Yeah. It, today, everything's so easy, well, isn't it? It's it is. convenient. It's well, not necessarily easy because today it's all about getting into debt. Well, you yeah, know, but paying the, for things. The, the messaging is incorrect as well. There's a lot of marketing there that's, uh, that's suffocating. And if you're vulnerable or easily influenced, you can be sucked into this world of consumerism and all that. And all of a sudden, as you say, you know, you end up in it's a world of death. Mm. You've got to be careful, you know, yeah. you have to be careful. So, Tom, you uh, we spoke about your woodwork, but of course, the principal uh, material that yeah. you use is metal. Correct. Tell us a little bit about the sort of things that you make and the sort of materials that you make them from. Okay, yeah, no problem. I, I use predominantly black mild steel, which is just a basic mild steel, run of the mill, standard black mild steel. <laughs> I, I, I make my uh, my torques and my my triscals and my spirals and my uh, brooches. So uh, that's basically all the the, the the raw material for them for that product. Like what else? Just to give the viewers who may not know what's involved, what else would be made from mild steel? Well, it's a, it's a general steel for a lot of fabrication there, so you could get the standard lens, then it'd be box sections or flats. So, I mean, it's a general run-of-the-mill steel there. It's not a specialised steel as such. If you go into specialised, uh, you know, a hardened material there, toolmaker steel, that's a different a different machine. Then, different so tool. you'd get um, maybe um, lorry trailers and machines that are made from yeah. mild steel, would you? Or? Well, yeah. The, the, the chassis would there there'd be a certain flex within the chassis there just to absorb some of that type of fatigue there over the life of the product but the springs for example that would be a high carbon steel that would be a very useful sp uh, spring steel there where I, I get a lot of tooling out of by uh, working uh, spring steel by annealing it shaping it to shape and then I can go and harden and temper it. it becomes a very useful tool then in fact some of the blades have been made from the spring steel there which gives a beautiful edge there when it's hardened and tempered and it's honed then razor sharp then show us some of the raw material that you kind yeah. of start out with so i could have a piece of a square section a 10 by 10 or it could be 12 by 10 cut to that type of length 
then I can go and forge I can go and forge the body then of a, of a, a pinnacular brooch it's just the, the, the body of it then then the pin then is a separate project then which would be made then of a round material that's a six mil round I could have a ten mil round I can draw the taper out and that the forge there to give it a little bit of body coming down to a point I can make then the little clevis then then that'll wrap itself around the brooch itself and then that that'll be finished then then ready then for the, the so this the is linser. made from from the square down correct stuff, yeah is it? yes and how, how is it just a matter of twisting it is it what i do there is there if you can imagine that now starts off as you see there i'll draw the ends of that there to a point so the draw the taper then from the bottom the middle of the section there right out to a point i'll establish the scrolls so i've got the scrolls then on both ends and then what i do then is I use a, a small little cutting disc to cut a slot up on the flat sp uh, face here and, and on all four sides and that gives it a little bit of three dimension, it gives it a little bit of depth. Ah, so nice. when I do go and uh, twist it, you can see there it's got a nice dimension there where the, where the twist is split. So it gives it a little bit of depth, it gives it a nice you know, feel to it there regarding you know, just a little bit more personality, a little bit more character. And then what I do then is I establish then the, the actual shape of the brooch itself by using some wood. I have to use the wood, I can't use the anvil because steel on steel will actually distort all the flat spots there. I lose the edge in it there and it'll, it'll look, it won't look right at all. Yeah, and so how long would it take you to make one of these? Well, from start to finish, there's definitely two hours work there. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. So this is one of the things that we kind of have to uh, accentuate with Tom's work is that it's most of what's done is handmade. Correct. It's not made w with a machine. Yes. It involves time, heating and and shaping, heating and shaping, yeah. heating and shaping again. There could be about 15 heats in that alone. Wow. Yeah. OK. And that's that's getting it now to a real good, well established forge that, uh, you know, it's right up to temperature there. I've got then a window of uh, 30 seconds, 40 seconds to do what I need to do, and it's back in the heat. Because it cools down. Correct. And, yeah. and when it cools down, you Correct. can no longer yeah. get it to You to see, with a twist like that there, were. I will twist so far up the shank that while it comes out of the forge red hot, I have to stabilise some of that part of it there with using the cauldron and the water. So now I have frozen a twist that's already established and then focus on the area that's not twisted but still has the heat. Yeah. So there's a balance act. If I take it out of the forge, so much of that is, 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 is hot and ready to work. But there's only so much I want to work, whereas I need to neutralise and stabilise work that's already established. Although it's red hot, I need to kill that out and get, a, get the water on it to freeze it. So I work on the area that I need to. And that's what gives it that nice, even twist for the full length of the actual brooch. Uh, then the early developments, and as I spoke to you about earlier on, about the development of the brooch. And, and this, is, this is the disappointing element of the design, but it's a matter of practic practice. While I started doing that, the first models, or the first, the first brooches, the twist was irregular. It wasn't consistent the full length. Some of the brooch was too tight, and some of the brooch was too loose. It was very visual there. You could see the difference in the shank on the brooch itself, where some of it was too tight, some of it was too loose. But that's an experience that you learn from. Say, well, right, well, why did that happen? And when you can answer that question, saying, well, this is what happened regarding the heat and the balancing with the water, there was no balance. You, you know, the, you upset a twist that was already established. You try to work another part of the brooch for a twist, but instead you upset another part of it that was already established. So again, it's all to do with the learning. So that learning, it takes about five or six brooches to get to the level where you say, right, I've cracked it. Yeah. I now know what to do. But that's like, as I say, it's like it's learning. Every day is a learning day. When you put the time into the brooches, there comes a point where after a number of efforts, all of a sudden it works. Yeah. But you know the reason why it works, and that's critical. Yeah. Once you know why it works then it works so it's amazing because when we think about smithing we think about heat yeah but it's not just heat and fire correct. there's also the cooling and the water yeah and there's the time that it remains hot correct which is the critical time that it can be worked correct and then yeah. it cools to the point that it yeah. can't be worked yeah and then it has to go back into the fire again like, like over the years now the one thing i would say about the, the smith work is the the ability to work and control the fire if i have the forge to forging temperature i'm happy with my fire but now the skill set is there where to place the steel. I can make corridors with the poker 
by arranging the fire in a certain dimension. So I can say, right, I've got the heart of the forge where I want it. I've got this corridor where I can place the work in it. I can cover it over with a poker. I know then in my mind how long it's going to take it to get to the right temperature where I need it to be. And it's out, it gets worked and gets back in. So like, for example, the, the swan pendants, that's a nice little, little pendant. There's no point in having this part of the scroll red hot, whereas here is where I want the heat. Yeah. All the heat is there, but yet this is this is not hot enough. And all of a sudden, if I put that on the anvil and strike it with a hammer, I can make a mess of the scroll. It just distorts it. It just distorts it. Yeah. And, and the one thing I'm very critical at is the concentricity there of the actual scrolls. I, I really do pride me work there regarding the feel of how a concentric scroll can roll in itself. The metal will do what it wants to do, but you've got to allow it to do it. If you, if you don't give it the right platform from the forge, it, you, you'll never get it working. It takes a long time to just to get it that you're happy with it, concentric. So once I get the bills established and I start from the centre and I work out, it, it kind of works itself, but I have to be able to keep ahead of it. If I don't keep ahead of it, then I'm into rework or repair, and that's a negative space. You don't want to be there because then it's frustrating. You're trying to recover something that you've made a mess of. If I start off with a, you know, a, a draw to taper, get a standard 6 mil and it's drawn to taper, nice point, and I get the bill established and I get it off the anvil, there's a section on the anvil there that allows me to start off uh, with, 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 the, with the, right, you know, the right beginning, the right start. And once I get that established, everything follows suit. It's very natural for it to follow because at the end of the day, you're making a circle. A circle within its context of a concentric build from the centre right out. It will follow itself because yeah. it will always follow the path where you want. And at the end of the day, when you focus on the process and you do it as you know from experience, you're left with then a scroll that's nice and tight, that's concentric with respect then to the artwork it represents. Yeah. Sure, I could have a, a, a very uneven scroll. And some will say, yeah, that's bespoke, that's unique, that's fine. But in the context of, if you look at a lot of the stone carvings and how you know, concentric it is, there was a lot of respect given to a spiral that started from the centre and works its way out to the outside. And, and that's, it's, just a, it's just a way of doing it. So you know? it follows a certain sort of a way of working. Of but course. of course it does help to have skilled hands and yeah. that bit of experience. Yeah. So all of your swan spiral pendants start out as this. Correct. This is circular in uh, profile. Correct. Uh, what did you say? Six mil. Six mil steam. round. Yeah. And so they all start as this. They do. And so that's what that's that is the raw material. Yeah. And show us the. Oh, sorry, I have one here that I yeah. can show you. This is the uh, Tom. You can hold that up there. Can do. Yeah. That camera will will catch it. And this is the finished. Uh, a product, I hate to use that word. Yeah. Creation is a much nicer word. Well, yeah, I mean, it started off, and I remember Nora, a great friend of, uh, of, of our own there on the, on the mythical community there. Oh, we, Nora Gaffney yeah, O'Connor. Nora. The lady who swims in the sea every day of the year, yes, even absolutely. when it's Baltic. Good, good on you, Nora. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, was a, it, was a, you know, it was a conversation over on the comments there that you know, the swan became the reality then because of what the spiral looked like. And all of a sudden, the idea came into my mind and said, you know what, let's follow on that conversation. And all of a sudden, I've taken then the spiral, what you have in your hand, I've cut it to length there, I've got the, the neck, and again, a little bit of imagination, a little bit of shape on the anvil, and then with the needle nose pliers, we create the neck and the, 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 the swan beak. and the beak. Yeah. And it's a swan, you know. And so from this yeah. to that, and Tom, of course, it being the uh, modest man that he is, makes it sound very easy, and he actually <laughs> makes it look very easy. Um, yeah. But this is, I mean, this is the start. This is the finish. Yes. And the finish, of course, combines two beautiful elements of Newgrange, specifically Newgrange, because you have the spiral which proliferates at Brunavonia in the megalithic art, yeah. but you also have the swan which yeah. is there in the stories. Yeah. And I think it's lovely the way you've combined that, yeah. the the artwork with. The mythology correct and and it, it, it's a unique item correct. it's a swan that is ultimately in the shape of a spiral absolutely i mean again it's 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 art with a story behind it yeah and when you can give a story to some art there's a connection then people can feel the connection with it oh, and I the response so. with the swan has been incredible over the last two years i people can imagine have, have been so personal with their comments there they have really connected with it and it's a joy to just deal with people and uh, you know to and of course the whooper swans um you know i've written about a lot a lot about them in my work they come to newgrange to winter there they do yeah. from iceland 
they yeah. they travel whatever that is a thousand miles in in the winter time <laughs> ironically the swans come to ireland in the winter because it's warmer here yeah uh, you know we actually do have mild winters um, just in the past 24 hours, a very good friend of mine, um, Jack Rogers from Newgrange Gold, uh, who make uh, oils, c- cooking oils and, and vegetable oils, uh, uh, rapeseed oil that's grown in the Boyne Valley. He shared a video of the whooper swans oh. coming over his head wow. in a big flock and coming down to land on the Boyne right. beneath Crewban there, wow. uh, west of Nouth, yeah. between Nouth and Slane, yeah. making this tremendous honk, yeah. this honking noise, you know. Yeah, it. And it's the most extraordinary thing to see when you consider that actually the swans have been coming there, we think, at least since Newgrange Correct. was built. And that, that was part of the inspiration for yes. some of the stories there. Yeah, it's yeah. lovely to be able to combine those Correct. things, oh, the important. elements of the art and the elements of the story. Correct. Tom, tell us a little bit more about some of the other. We have to, of course, talk about what, what I might call the pièce de résistance, which is the <laughs> triscal. Uh, the triscal being the triple spiral. And of course, the triple spiral in megalithic art is only found at Newgrange. It is not found in any other Neolithic Irish monument, yeah. uh, which makes it very, very specific to Newgrange. Now, when I first uh, saw one of these, yeah. I-, I thought, wow, what a genius. How, how has it been possible to make this yes. from one piece of metal? And of course, the assumption was it was from one piece. It's not from one piece. Tom, talk us through what's well, involved in making it, one of those. Again, the, the, the end goal is as you see it. So we have that as the objective of the criteria of the project. And then the how-to then becomes the, the challenge, so to speak. It starts off, again, a length of round, 10 mil round. And basically, I draw the taper and then I create, I create that from that piece of length. And this isn't wound t- closely no. like the swan spiral. Yeah. It's wound loosely. Woos- lo- <laughs> Sorry, that's an outtake. Uh, it's wound loosely with space between it. Yes, that's quite tricky because oh, I, I can I, imagine. Yeah, I want I want consistency, but I want to have it looking as natural a flow as possible. And that's the one thing when you learn how to scroll with gap it's very easy that the flat spots become evident then inside the piece and that's a, a niggler uh, really it is it's like yeah, a, it's yeah. like buying a brand new car with a scratch of the bonnet you don't want it it's something that really niggles you he's a perfectionist too. <laughs> so i mean look you get a lot of pride there uh, with, the, with the draw the taper so that's got a nice say uh, point to it there and then the secret is you start off then with the again the bill and you you want to have that in the forge there where you want to heat the right material at the right temperature and be able to get to the anvil there and give it that character and give it that feel and all of a sudden you have a very nice naturally flowing scroll now if i had a bad day and i come to the forge late or something was on my mind it's incredible how that can be reflected in this work there regarding flat spots i could have the best intentions and i'd say i want to get a, a, a 10 of these done and if i'm not in form first three or four of them could be a, a nightmare because i'm not in the zone it can send the, the actual work in the anvil can sense that there's something that your, your mind is not where it should be wow. and if you just walk away from it go away and come back at it clear the mind start with it go at it again it's incredible how we can just reflect then a good attitude good mind space and then it happens it happens naturally and all of a sudden you get one made and you can put that one down and whatever you're working on that you work that then as the benchmark whereas that's where you need to be and that's what you need to create and all of a sudden they've got then 10 of them made so obviously you need to make three of these for every triscal that you make I but, ma- but yeah. how do they uh... what i do is i make the three of them and then i have to make a piece of material in the middle to replicate the that centerpiece and then i weld them to together them all correct yeah and even after that, then I presume there's further. Oh, there is. Is there grinding? There is. Or, or? There's shaping it because I have the centerpiece that mates up then with the three scrolls, and then I got to give it then its shape. This is where a lot of time is spent, where I'm where I'm polishing, I'm grinding, I'm giving it the shape, and then I come with the texturing. And of course, it has to be said again: these are yeah. all handmade. Correct. So every triskel is different. Correct. They're not identical. No. Because of those little tiny discrepancies, discrepancies yeah, or correct. little yeah. changes that happen because yeah. each time you make one, yeah. you know, it's just slightly different than correct. the last. You see, the, the actual nature of the piece itself is, is forgiving to that very point. It comes from the centre and it spirals out. So within reason, I have a little bit of a plus or minus shape versus if you had five of them. They're very, very similar, but they're not identical which favours then 
the actual, you know, the Triskel itself. I don't want it to be mechanically perfect. No, no, no. It's got to have a little bit of, you know, everyone has their own personality. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. like even the position of the of the of the inner scrolls there. They're not all in the same point. If you if you if stack them up, there's slight discrepancy in them. There's slight discrepancies even in the weight of the tip. That's a very fine tip there. That would struggle in the forge, but I got away with it, okay. and it it adds the finesse to it yes. then, which it works quite well in the end. It does. But I know if I had that in the forge there, that could boil up in me there, and I could lose it. Yeah. And losing work then, having done the draw and mm -hmm. taper, it can be very frustrating because you've spent time preparing the scrolls, and all of a sudden you've got something boiling up in the forge, and you've lost it. You may throw it away. It's no good. When I look at these, I, I see this kind of rusted metal, and I see this beautiful sort a black polish finish tell yeah. us a little bit then about when it's finished yeah. Tom it's not finished because no. then you have to coat it or Correct. you have to well I, I use a very old traditional blacksmith finish it's as old as the hills the linseed oil the boil linseed oil it's basically a, an oil finish on hot metal now the metal is in the fire I get that I don't get it red hot I don't need to get it red hot but I get it very hot yeah and then I apply then the bit the linseed oil the boil linseed oil and the oil reacts then with the hot, st hot steel, where the pores of the steel actually open up ever so slightly to receive in the oil, which acts then as an, ax uh, an antioxidizing agent. Now, it does need a little help. It needs uh, an atmosphere there of a warm house, for example. You couldn't just leave it out in the shed because the surface rust will, uh, will appear. But it discolours the metal and it gives that lovely old patina finish on yeah. the little... On 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 and the, on over the time, oil. that shines up does, if it's it if does. it's handled or Correct. if it's yeah it just, uh, like with the swan spirals when they're worn because i, I know I, I have my own one here and and it's got a kind of a a sheen on it that the original doesn't have Correct. you know it has yeah. that and, yeah. and it, it actually gives it a, a sort of a nice look it does it? yeah absolutely yeah i mean it's it's personalized it's become part of your day you know i mean you're just enjoying it you know and that's what it's for that's what it's about so we've seen the Triskel and we've seen the Swan Spiral Pendant. Yeah. And what else? We have, have you a, been well, on? it's just a little bit of a fun item, so to speak. You know, uh, I've taken the 10 mil round again, and rather than with a spread, a, a scroll, I've just compacted and I've kept it tight. And it says, right, okay, let's have a little bit of fun here. The mythical letter opener. I mean, it's just a novelty item. It's got the tight, the tight uh, wound spiral. And then we've got, uh, you know, we've got the tang on it there, which is ultimately this here. And all of a sudden it's forged out flat and i'm able to grind a, a blade on it so uh, such but it's not actually a sharp blade it it's got a little edge you. and it wouldn't yeah. cut you but at the same time you know it would make uh, opening those letters that little bit easier and again it's a novelty item you know well so. tom I, I i can say i can tell the viewers as they've seen already that uh, you presented me with one of bit those of fun, yeah and it's on my desk yeah in my little pencil the pen holder yeah and any time I get a, a car, I get lots of cards from the Tua, by the way, and I've had lots of Christmas cards, and it's the most beautiful thing to receive cards from around the world, just wishing you well. But this is now the official post opener, and it works very well. Very good. And as you say, it hasn't got a blade on it that would cut you, yeah. but it's definitely more than enough to uh, to smoothly open the envelopes. Yeah. Well, that's very clever well, because you wouldn't think looking at them but it's as you say it's the same what you say 10 mil correct but yes. it's just wound tightly rather than wound loosely loosely there i go again wound loosely lound loosely <laughs> I, lo I love those spitty wounderisms <laughs> um yeah and uh, so how much work is involved in uh, you know this part of it oh yeah i mean that's a uh, that starts off as you can imagine like that there so basically into the fire forged out on the anvil and uh, I, I create that consistent thickness then and then what I do then is I have to draw out then with the French chalk the shape of the the blade so to speak and then I'll grind that and I'll grind it on the belt grinder then to give it the edge and to give it a little bit of finish then so again even though there's a little bit of machinery involved it's all handmade Correct. each one yeah these aren't put these aren't um, um, molten metal that's being poured into a mold these are all starts these all off, starts off, starts off with, with the raw material that's basically it and yeah. is worked artistically into you know a finish yeah well yeah the the, the joy is uh, when you scroll and you can finish off and say right how does that go well it's either concentric or it's not concentric is what i need if it's not i doesn't doesn't make the mark i don't i don't want the flat spots i don't want to be recovering from rework no 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 yeah the quality is not that i have to have a concentric and it's doable when you get it can you get when you get one done it means it can be done so you go and do that and that's the benchmark and that's that's what you're you're always yeah. trying to achieve you know? brilliant stuff so tom tell us uh, is there anything else do you want to talk um, for a moment about your blade oh yeah 
Well, again, this is uh, this is going this back is to what we spoke there earlier there with the spring steel. So uh, I've had a pal there who left me a little bit of a uh, spring steel uh, from a trailer. So quite excited then to uh, start the, the, the journey of uh, making the blades. So this is uh, the Bowen blade. So it's very early in its days. I've had the, the first forging complete. Basically what I've done is I have forged it there so that the actual thickness is uh, narrower here at the front than it is at the back. So the spine of the blade is okay, it's consistent and thick. But that's now forged at the front. That's ready now to start the first grinds. The tip has also been forged as well. That started off there, consistent in the thickness there, right up here. Get the tip reddened and forge that back so the grain of the steel then is following the tip. So that tip would be tremendously strong. So again, a little bit of a scroll there uh, for, for the pommel. And uh, I, I have a little bit of uh, antler from, uh, from whatever deer. I have it there for age there. So I'm going to use some antler horn for the handle Brilliant. and a brass a hand guard and then a, a wooden scarbot there for the for the actual sword itself and a little bit of leather and so this know. is basically an adventure for you into the unknown correct and right uh, yeah. it's, it's a prototype it is yeah for future work that absolutely will be yeah more time consuming correct uh, but higher value items i presume well it's a challenge as well to, to to take on the project and be able to complete it because i do see the opportunity to to be the blade maker to be the swordsmith i'm really looking forward to go mm. down that that uh, rabbit hole when it presents itself but by degrees you know yeah. we keep working away on the small on the small items and keep building up and allowing a little bit of time during the week to work on the like of that because i know i can do it but i have to prove that by doing it and when it's done and it's finished and it's in your hand that box is ticked and then we can look at this the process and say well right how what was the learning from that and what was the mistakes from that and take those mistakes add it to the experience and go to the next level yeah. because i do see at some point where i will be casting bronze i'll be casting brass making the the sword the hand guards and all the pommels. i have to apologize here about the focusing I in my head but i have, have to prove it, it. Prove the camera was manually focused on tom you learn, you learn. this scene when you take when you take was focused on me i don't yeah. know how that happened yeah. so, I mean, I'm but i did uh, that I'm able to correct do it, it again but it's just a matter of doing it now apologies well, i would also add that i'm confident that tom can do it absolutely and i know what you're capable of well as i say you know and and again when i look at a lot of the 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 swordsmiths and the bladesmiths on instagram and facebook and it's an incredible suite of talented gentlemen and ladies all over the world and I'm saying that's an amazing skill set and I'm here in the Boyne Valley and all I have to do is pick up a book and say wow look at this and almost every picture there's some warrior depicted with the shield and the sword and as a maker and a creator that's tremendously excitable because then you can say right I can make that yeah. and you go and make it and you have the story of that particular story or warrior or whatever behind that and it adds the value to it and you know there was at one time the makers in the Boyne Valley that did that. That was their livelihood, Correct. you know. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just it's nice to be able to keep it going. Well, I I look forward to the whole process and seeing the finished product, yeah. and I also wish you the very best of luck with Thank it. Thank you and, so much. And I'm sure, like all the things that you've you've done, I'm sure that we'll be sitting here maybe in six months or twelve months or eighteen months time saying. Wow, <laughs> that worked out well. Well, the, the, you know? the, the support from the tour has been tremendous. I mean, it's, great, it's great to see the feedback and to get the comments there because it really is encouraging. Because it can be lonely when you're on your own working away here, but when you click on and you see the feedback there from the community there, that just gets yeah. you the pip yeah, in your it step it's there. Brilliant, it's very, it? very encouraging. Keeps you going. Is there anything else? Show us another of those just couple of bits and pieces. Oh, some of me, yeah, yeah. These are, these are a fun item again. Now it's kind of needing a good wire brush, but it's been sat there for the last six months. These are known as the, the Celtic uh, warrior bands, you know, the arm bands. So you place them on your arm. And I read up about this, which is a very interesting story there. Basically, they were an identifier there of your rank among the Tua. So whatever tribe you were from, if you were called to battle, and depending on how brave you were or whatever you'd done during that battle. How many heads you'd chopped off. How many off, heads you chopped instance. off. Yeah. <laughs> when you got back to the, the king or the... The general, whoever was in charge of that battalion, you know, you, they, they would say, right, Anthony, you done a stern job during that battle. There you go. And you wore those uh, arm rings and you, you know, you walked around Drogheda and the, the people of Drogheda would look and say, do you know what? You don't mess with that man because he's got his, uh, he's got his uh, ranking there of how brave a warrior he was during that particular battle. I don't so, think I'd end up having any of those. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be war, uh, battle fit, I don't think. Yeah, so I mean, look, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting and, and I do see it in Sean's work there regarding a lot of the imagery there and, you know, the great warriors and the great, you know, 
and, and you can see the arm rings been used and been worn and again it's a, a status a rank among the people and it's an incredible it's a lovely thing to think about you know so there's doesn't seem to be anything that you can't do i mean and it's wonderful that again that the inspiration is all drawn from the stories and you know oh, absolutely. And in some cases from the archaeology yeah um and, and and it really just goes to show that when you put the the raw material into the hands of the right person the extraordinary things can happen and extraordinary things have been happening at tom's forge over the last couple of years we've been very glad to sort of watch in on that and watch your progress and of course recently you took a very very big step in life tom which was you announced yes on one of the live streams correct that you're now full time at this correct so you've yeah. given up the day job correct with a view to making this your vocation correct yeah, uh, which is basically following your bliss. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the dream was many years ago, you know, this was going to happen. The question was when, when would the right time be? So, I mean, you know, everyone has a dream. And if you work hard enough at your dream, it can actually become reality. But you've got to put the effort in. It doesn't come, <clears throat> it doesn't come on a platter and present it to you. You know, so you've got to work. I mean, I mean, 30 years ago, I started collecting my machinery and bits and pieces that became, you know, that became available whether they be gifted or there was something going for scrap i always knew that i had a vision what i could do and how i can justify that especially if you're working for yourself yeah and again i comes to a crossroad i come to a crossroad there last august september and i said you know what i think the timing is right and i bite the bullet but i don't want to go through life and you look back in life and say you know what you only talked about it yes. you didn't do it you yeah. only talked about it so that's a confidence thing if you have the confidence you go with it you grab it with both hands and you know the support is there and you know just make it happen whatever you put in life is what you get out so certainly when you put the work in i think the reward is tenfold there but it does does require work it requires a commitment it's daunting but you know what it's challenging and more importantly it's exciting you know when you think about ireland and the little postage stamp of a country and an island we are on that on that great span of water and look at all the two that's looking in from all over the world and that's just scratching the surface, yeah. you know. So it's incredible how 15 years ago, if you were to say that smartphone, you would be able to connect to all these people and it's a matter of pressing a button and you have a message or you have a live feed or you could talk on camera. You know, we dreamed about that yeah. 15 years ago. And now no. it's reality. Isn't it incredible? It's reality. So, so when you have that kind of, when you have that tool in your tool chest, you say, you know, how can I make the most of that? And all of a sudden, you know, you've got contact from Australia, from America, from Canada. The world is a small place. You know, so keep working away. It is. Uh, well, um, it's proof, if nothing else, that you can do something that you enjoy. Yeah. So now yeah. you're getting out of bed in the mornings. Correct. And you're faced into a day of what we might call work. Yeah. But it's not work because no. you enjoy it. Oh, absolutely. And they say that if you combine your passion Correct. with your em employment as it were or yeah. your vocation yeah. you'll never feel like you're working oh, no doubt about that. and that's a beautifully yeah. uh, privileged Correct. but exciting yeah. uh, place to be i'm sure what, what i can see happening and i really i really am enjoying the development of it as we're sat here on your throne and the grand table <laughs> set you know and even in costume i get a lot of satisfaction of bringing someone to the forge and some people last year, they have never even held a hammer in their life. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you hand them the hammer, you hand them the steel, the forge is lit, you show a sample being made, you go through the whole sequence of start to finish, and all of a sudden, it's your turn. Yeah. And you watch the confidence and watch what just emerges from someone who's never done it before to someone then that spent two hours working with the forge with a little bit of instruction, enjoying the hospitality and enjoying the experience. It's a wonderful thing to be able to yeah. share because... That anvil, I have three anvils, large anvils here. They're all over 100 years old. They're, they're a really, really old Brilliant. anvil. So you can imagine yeah, the story yeah. that goes with that. Now, there's two things that can happen to that anvil. It can either be continued to be used or it ends up in a ditch buried and it's been forgotten about. We don't want to think of it like that. We want to think of it that the craft still continues and people come and enjoy it, work the metal, but also the conversation, the ability to sit down and enjoy the hospitality, the bit of food, the bit of fun. And that rolls up into an incredible experience and that's the tremendously rewarding thing and i think yeah. there's opportunity for that as well yeah because yeah. as i say if we had the map of mead and you drew newgrange Knout and doubt fort knox lock crew you know all the wonderful ancient sites and all of a sudden ungava appears amongst them all well you're only a 15 minute drive then from any of these sites there if you make the effort to say well you know what come and relax and just enjoy it you know yeah and I'll say one thing. Uh, this is my probably my fifth or sixth visit to the forge. 
I have always enjoyed my time at the Forge. Time always flies when I'm here. Yeah. And I always go away with a sense that I've met somebody who is really alive to the world <laughs> and is really, really following their passion. Yeah. I come away inspired mm -hmm. by it, you know. And you're right, because sometimes, you know, your, I mean, my craft, of course, is writing. Yeah. I'm sitting at a computer or a typewriter. Yeah. Sometimes I'm handwriting. Yeah. And that can be a very lonely task. Of course. But the lovely thing is when you publish your work. Correct. And you send it out into the world. Yeah. And then people come back and tell you what they thought of it and that they thoroughly enjoyed it and that they want to come and see the landscape. And sometimes they yeah. take part in a mythical Ireland tour. Yeah. And they actually get to touch the monuments as yeah. it were to be up yeah. close and personal Correct. with them and to yeah. sort of feel some of that themselves yeah. it's about more than this isn't a manufacturing facility really Correct. this yeah. is an artist who is you know plying his trade yeah. enjoying what he does Correct. and hoping that yeah. he can inspire not just the message of the monuments and the myths yeah. but also of the landscape in which you, know, you grew up in Absolutely, that yeah. you're totally in love with that yeah. you feel very well rooted to the place yeah, yeah, you know yeah. like uh, you're like me i never had uh an inkling to wander i mean i have done some travel but i'm so rooted to the boyne valley yeah. i never see myself moving away from here Correct. okay I, I, i'm just totally in love with the place yeah. i think i realized the power of it you no know? doubt about that and and yeah. especially i was coming across here this morning i was telling you before we started the cameras rolling i was playing some of my music i was playing some u2 and i passed the ledwidge cottage francis ledwidge museum in slain and i just thought about how many wonderfully creative artists have come out of ireland Correct. you know and isn't it such a pleasurable thing that the place that we live in gives us Correct. so much yes and that we're able to draw so much from that and yes. of course we're grateful of course for that Correct. you know yeah absolutely no yeah. i completely agree with that but it's 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 finding that confidence within yourself mm. and the visitor because people have it they just need encouragement mm. there's always different levels of confidence but the encouragement can bring you up another level no matter what level you're at you know yeah it's the same i i uh, not at the moment because of covid but i i have uh, taught music to kids yeah and like that, encouragement is 75% of the work. Correct. You know, that especially people, children in particular, but, but people in general who, yeah. who lack a little bit of confidence. Yes. That uh, Richard Moore, my good friend, his father, his late father was a, a doctor, a GP. And okay. Richard would often tell me that a lot of people would come to the house, which is where the surgery was. And yeah. His father used to tell Richard that, you know, in an awful lot of cases, just sitting down and listening to people is Correct. like... Yeah. 80 or 90 yeah. percent of yeah. what's needed to help cure them there's no doubt about that that yeah. they share their problem yeah. and in, in in a similar way you're yeah. bringing people who've maybe never done this and and in their mind they yeah. never even thought about it yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. you're bringing them and showing them that well actually maybe you can make something and oh, you know there's no doubt about it they can absolutely without even question they can they just need that encouragement it's like it's like if you know you, you, you got to bring it right back to basis because there's a fear element. And the one thing about the forge, it gets the adrenaline going. There's something incredibly about, about a fire and a fire that's raging there, that's right in front of you there. And when you put steel into it and you take it out and you can feel that, you don't touch yeah. it, you can feel it though. So you know the respect it demands. Your system goes into overdrive there because of the dangers and the adrenaline rush. So if you can, when you can harvest that then into the context of making something, whatever it is, and looking at, well, this is the one you started off with. You've done 10 of them. Look at the tent effort versus the very first one. What's the difference? And you can see that transition from never done it before to now you've got 10 under your wing and you're, you've done this and you've yeah. made an effort. And look what's happened because of a bit of practice. You just, be, it's, you just see this elation and it's incredible. It's hard to describe. Well, I, see would, it. I would consider that I'm not very good with my hands. And just to prove what Tom is saying, in a little amount of time, Tom is going to encourage me to try and make something at the forge so do hang on uh, this uh, video is probably we're probably a well well up to an hour or, or so so far we have more to come because we have a big announcement to make and then we're going to go to the forge and, and i'm going to try and make something i can't promise that i'm going to do it with the flourish that mr king does of course the talented on gawa on goba uh, but we are certainly going to give it a try hang on one moment and we'll be right back so, Tom, 
one of the principal reasons I came out to see you, apart from to talk about your wonderful work and where you're going with it, yes. was that you and I have a very special announcement to make today. Well, uh, I hope a series of announcements. <laughs> um, so a while back, uh, in the early t days of the pandemic, um, Tom became a regular viewer on the the daily live streams and it, it quickly became apparent that he was watching while f forging presented me with a beautiful gift of some oak trees and they came on a special holder which tom had made in his forge and later i i received a beautiful gift of of a triskel and some other bits and pieces and it just struck me that here was an extraordinarily gifted person and uh, who was working away and whose dream was to to do this as a passion so anyway the long and short of it is that over the past while tom and i have been chatting and plotting and scheming <laughs> and i suggested to tom that well why don't i give tom uh, a vehicle or an avenue through which he can sell his work and that exists already of course in the form of mythical ireland and so what we've done is uh as of tonight at the launch of this video and i hope you're all watching from around the world um from this moment forward you are going to be able to buy some of tom's creations on mythicalireland.com and Tom, we've already spoken about some of them because we were talking about the process of making them. Yeah. But we're starting off uh, today with three items. Correct. Um, to suit different tastes and different pockets and all the rest. The first item that you'll be able to buy on Mythical Ireland is the Swan Spiral Pendant. Tom, you, you can tell us uh, about the price and uh, we should also talk about uh, the fact that you know that each item will be sent by registered post so there'll be the cost of the item plus postage and packaging but tom will tell you a little bit about what that postage and packaging will uh, incorporate yes so the the item itself is the is the is the the swan pendant and i, and I do like to use a, a nice quality leather with that and i've always been uh, giving a little bit of extra leather at uh, different colors there as part of the pendant so that customer can you know take and 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 use as she or he may see fit so the, the pendant itself is 40 euros and that's then plus registered post and packaging so uh, there's the different rates then obviously that ireland uk europe america and australia so uh, that'll be on the website I'm sure you'll be able to select those individually so if you go into mythicalireland.com and you go into gallery and shop and it'll be on Gova or on Gawa Creations, I think is what I'm going to call it. And in there, you'll be able to select each item. When you select the item, you'll then select Ireland, which is the whole island, because the postage for Northern Ireland is the same as Ireland. Yeah. Britain, Europe, and then rest of world. Okay. Um, yeah. And and as I say, Tom, you're one of the things that I really loved about <laughs> when you send something, oh, yeah. you don't just shove it in an envelope no, and send no. it you package them very carefully well, don't you uh, it's, it's absolutely critical i take a lot of pride in my packaging there and i think the packaging is so important just as the experience because someone reaches out to make the order is very much appreciated so as the maker and the creator i very much appreciate that and i always compliment that uh, including the package is as important there as the actual product itself and again i'm representing the creators and the ancestors again in the spirit of the the product or the the item and i have to think very carefully and say well you know what well, with respect to the two of the thousands of years ago you know and the makers and all that has given us what we have and you know for the world to reach out and, and look into our world and say Do you know what it's very important that you give them the experience because i've had so many people with so much positivity before they've even opened the package yeah. that they've experienced that there you know i use the hemp cloth or the old uh, seed cloth there and i think that's authentic there regarding the style and the nature of the work and you know i, I do like to give a little bit of the artwork there and 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 and, and the simple words of a gift from the boyne valley mm. you know and, and and that goes down tremendously well there and, and i want to continue with that you know yeah, yeah. it's very simple but it means the world to a lot of people you know what yeah. i mean so uh, I, you know it's, it's, there's a lot of fun with it too it's you brilliant know? 
Like, so so the, the Swan Spiral Pendant is one of three things yes. that you will now be able to buy on mythicalireland.com. Correct. The second one is the letter opener, which was inspired originally by something I said on a live stream that I was <laughs> opening correspondence. And Tom said, hmm, there's yeah, an idea. I had a light bulb moment, a mythical Brilliant. light bulb moment. <laughs> so I, again, you know, it's a it's a novelty item. You know, it's an item that uh, I think can sit on a lot of people's desks. They're, you know, they can have a lot of fun with that there. And it's at hand. You get your letters, you open it, you enjoy that as part of your stationary collection. And that item there is 50 euro plus registered post and packaging. So again, the details are on the website. Brilliant, brilliant stuff. And the third item you'll be excited to learn is the, the Triscoll. Grange Triscoll, yes. Triscoll. Again, I've had a lot of fun with this item there over the last year and a half. It's been tremendously good to me there. So I'm delighted to offer now and work with Anthony on this here. So uh, that item is 100 euro plus the registered post plus the packaging as per details on the Mythical Island website. Yeah, and all we'll be saying in relation to this is one of the reasons we left it until now to do this was we wanted to do it coming up to the time of in bulk. We both feel that that's a very uh, wonderful time of the year when we're emerging from the hibernation of winter, when the days are growing, things are, you know, certain plants and trees are starting to grow. And, you know, when you feel that, life is sort of coming back yeah. um, uh, 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 as a, a sort of a t time of growth and uh, we also wanted to the practicalities demanded that Tom needed a bit of time to create a backlog of work yeah. um, just in case there's a big demand which hopefully there will be but uh, Tom's been busy for the past month or six weeks working away on creating all of the swan spiral pendants the letter openers and the triscals to yeah. have a stock there so that when you put in your order there'll be something there available for dispatch uh, immediately but we will be adding a disclaimer on each product that at busy times because every item is handmade allow for maybe a week's delay just in case uh, which hopefully will be the case Tom will sell out and he's just having to build up stock again yeah so we're very excited about this uh, new uh, uh, venture correct absolute partnership yes um, I delighted to support well, Tom thank, yeah. in his work well thank you so much Anthony for the opportunity I mean I really appreciate that it's been an incredible journey so it's been thoroughly enjoyable so well know, it's, it's a way of giving supportive. something back and I've, I've, I've always said that if I could find a way to support other people who share the same passion as I do yeah. about the land that they live in, about the monuments and the architecture and the the stories, then yeah. I would do everything in my power to give them a little bit of help along the way. So because do you know what? I have benefited immensely from the help of others in my journey, yeah. which, as you all know, began 23 years ago when I met Richard Moore in 1999. And only... In, in latter years, I realised that uh, uh, along the way you had a series of, I mean, Richard was one, mentors and people who came into your life who sort of identified with what you were doing, who gave you encouragement, who my publisher, David Givens at Livy Press, for instance, who in 2006 took a fairly hefty gamble on me, a gamble which I think has paid off. Um, Island of the Setting Sun at the time was the first colour publication. So... I'm passing that on now, as it were, um, and uh, hoping that yeah. you have the very best of luck well, and success, Tom, well, and yeah. you absolutely deserve every well, bit of it. Well, you're so good, Anthony. I'm so good. and so Brilliant. appreciative of that now. Thank you so much. Now, it doesn't stop there. Probably the most exciting announcement is this, that from now until the last day of February, if you order one or more, yeah. you're not uh, confined to ordering just one item. And we're actually going to put up a three-in-one special offer with a 15% discount. If you order one of Tom's items, or several, your name will be put into a hat for a free draw for what I consider to be a very high-value prize. And I'm going to introduce that to you now. But before I do, I just want to say that this is indicative of the man that's sitting before me 
of the tremendous creativity, the tremendous inspiration that he has drawn from things. We are at that time of year when winter is gradually giving way to spring. And that was marked in prehistory and in early historic times by the festival of Imbolc, which we also celebrate in the Christian calendar or St. Bridget's Day. And Bridget, of course, had a strong affinity with the Smiths. She's a very, very powerful figure of inspiration. Yeah. And what better thing to do than a Bridget's cross? Correct. Wait till you see this. And I'm just going to take this up here and hopefully you'll be able to see it. We'll present it for that camera there. Very good. This is Tom's beautifully created Bridget's cross. Uh, and I'll, 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 I'll get Tom to talk about the whole process in a moment. But I want to tell you that... Uh, Again, if you order any of the items we've been speaking about, your name will be automatically entered into a free draw for this. One winner will be produced from a hat on the last day of February. I'll do the draw in a live stream and the winner will receive this item. Now, I want to tell you, because Tom might be too modest to tell you, first of all, there's great skill and attention and, and craft to making this. But secondly, don't forget that it has a monetary value. This is a 500 euro item which could be yours for free if you order one of the other items and we're going to take it off its little plinth here tom and you take it there and you can tell us a little bit about what was involved in putting it together yes anthony thank you so much <clears throat> i mean i have a four mil round wire used for the making of the cross and uh, i wanted to keep the concept of the the weaving as tight as I could and, and I want to keep it compact so that the symmetry is both represented on the four legs of the cross and I didn't want to have it looking that it was a you know a vulgar fabrication I needed to keep the, the finesse of the cross in its original simplicity and its intent so I've established a centerpiece here and then I have a little bit of depth to it there where I have each of the legs welded behind that and I've, I've often made the, the crescent moon pendants, but I've actually used one of the crescent moon pendants here, without the crescent, as a little bit of a backup there for the cross itself, to give it a little bit of dimension, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit of a 3D depth to it. So it's given a little bit of depth to it, and then the legs, each of which then travels left, right, above and below, and tied as it would have originally been tied, like the way Bridget would have done it so. It's again steel wound there by using the same 4 mil wire. It's got a nice little bit of a, a tightness there. Again, looks very similar to the reed that would have been used, or the rushes that would have been used. And again, the same with the colour. I have a, a nice dark opaque green. I have a little bit of hint with a gold, a gold highlight. And then I use what's called a hot rod sparkle to give it a little bit of flicker before I go with the two coat a clear lacquer. So it's well finished it's well it's, it's well presented now so i'm very happy with that there and in the spirit of uh, of bridget and in particular the, the the blacksmith of the day all those years ago and uh, you know uh, i feel very humble that bridget is always looking in on the creatives and particularly the smith and the smith who makes the cross uh, i think again the luck of the Boyne Valley is with this now, and uh, good luck to to the winner and, and all involved yeah I, know. I, I i i can tell you that uh, uh, I've been in regular contact with Tom over the last uh, number of weeks as he has brought this piece to life. Tom, you made an initial prototype. Correct. And it taught you how you could and couldn't do things. Yeah. And when you had made that, you said, okay, what's, what are the advantages and the disadvantages? And you found a different way to Correct. do it. Yeah. And like, there's a huge amount of uh, man hours, love, uh, work, uh, and creative thought put into this piece. Yeah. It is fabulous. What Tom didn't mention, it also has a mounting bracket on the back so you can hang it on your wall, uh, which is obviously important to, to see. And it's finished in this green colour. Correct. Which you chose, why? Because it represents the, the rush, the traditional rush that was used. The colour of the rushes. Yeah. Isn't that brilliant? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I actually just feel honoured just to be able to hold it in my hand. Um, <laughs> And again, none of this is machine made. This is all put together by hand. I, I'm hoping, Tom, my yeah. hope is, yeah, and yeah. I'm just throwing this in there. My hope is that 
you will create many of these in the future. Yeah. Uh, but certainly this is a one-off item from the point of view that no two of these would ever be the same. Correct. Each one cre created by hand. Yes. So just to reiterate, this is a 500 euro item. Tom has very generously donated as a prize to all of you who buy any of, any of the other items on the website uh, that you'll be entered into a draw and on the on the last day of February which this is not a leap year is it it's the 28th of February or is it the 29th it's the 28th I'm pretty sure on the last whatever the last day of February it is that I'll hold a live stream and we will draw the lucky winner's name from the hat I'm just going to jump in there and pause the video just for one moment uh, with uh, an additional announcement that we hadn't planned, and that is uh, as a second prize in said draw, I will throw in a copy of the revised and expanded edition of Mythical Ireland. So there's two reasons. Uh, the cross will be the first prize and second prize will be a copy of uh, the revised and expanded edition of Mythical Ireland. So uh, what better way to celebrate the new venture, Correct. as it were, yeah. the new beginning for, for both of us, I'm hoping, um, as I say, a lovely way of supporting Tom's work, helping to put him on the map in the same way that others have helped to put me on the map over the years, uh, that, you know, Tom can uh, sell his work and make a living from it, because at the end of the day, that's what he is committed to doing. Correct. Uh, but this uh, beautiful item added into the fray um, just makes the whole thing uh, even more wonderful. Um, so all I can say is get your orders in and you never know. <laughs> you might be the one who in a month's time is uh, receiving this in the post by registered mail. Uh, it is fabulous. Thank you so much, Anthony. You're very yeah, be beautiful piece of work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it demonstrates again something I've been saying repeatedly throughout this video and that is that uh, I don't think there's anything that you can't put your hand to in yeah. terms of if you get an idea into Correct. your head yes. and you just think how could I do that yes what's involved in terms of material in terms of yeah. time in terms of you know the forge and the heat and the paint and the finish and all the rest yeah there's literally nothing you can't do tom gotta to, got to keep so. trying you never say never you know it is it is fabulously beautiful well, thank you so much yeah so that's going to adorn the the wall or the house or the home of uh one uh lucky uh mythical ireland viewer i hope in the not too distant future and that is tom king's beautifully finished bridget's cross we are here at the forge at bohermine uh, we've had a lovely conversation. I, I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I have. I've enjoyed it tremendously, Anthony. And of course, yeah. the hospitality of the Forge is second <laughs> to none. Now what's going to happen is we are going to go to the anvil. <laughs> Tom is going to do the impossible as far as I'm concerned. It's not impossible. Which is to get me to create something at the Forge. And I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah. So we'll move over there in a moment. As I say, in the meantime... It's www.mythicalireland.com. In the top menu, go to gallery and shop. In the drop down, go to Ongoa, Ongoba, whatever way you want to pronounce it. And go in there and you'll see uh, Tom's items that you can, Tom's wonderful creations that you can buy. And until the last day of February, when you buy, you're entered into the draw for the Bridges Cross. And what a wonderful way to finish our conversation today thank you tom you're very welcome Anthony. It's been thank you a fabulous pleasure <laughs> okay look forward to so hang on because we're going to the, the forge now course, in the meantime we'll see you no doubt hammering away oh, and forging yes. away in the background on still, the live stream still lots to go <laughs> we're just over the halfway well a little bit more well we, we want to make a swan so we are so uh, what i want to do is to I'm going the to, camera uh, placement talk you through it anthony there, you just it. how i do it in a sense there yeah from the length of six mil to a swan. So uh, I, I have a piece of the fire now at the minute. So brilliant. That's that's up to uh, that's ready now for the first hammering. So what I'm doing now is I'm drawing to taper on this. I'm basically taking the standard length and I'm drawing the taper. So we'll go ahead. 
so I'm basically using my left hand rolling it over 90 degrees so I'm using the two I'm using the hammer on that place there and I'm coming back and I'm hitting that there now while I do that the opposite is true the anvil is looking after that face there and the opposite as well so I have the hammer operating one and two but yet the, ha the surface on the anvil is looking after the other two faces now while I work that there you can see it coming to taper there so I always start off with the square now that's lost its colour now so it's not hot enough back into the fire back into the fire yeah, yeah. now normally I can do that in one heat that's how I, I, I score my efficiency I can do it's only a 6mm profile or 6mm round that's no problem with that because you're in the zone I can go like the hammers of hell and just go at it you know but I want to show you how I establish a nice draught taper you've got to go with first principles regarding the four faces because you're drawing six mil to a point you can't just go at it every way in any way you've got to give it a little bit of respect so I go with the two faces and let the hammer of the anvil sort out the other two so that's getting ready there now I've got a good forge going there and there's a nice fire that's a lovely fire yeah there's a nice fire there now nice heat off that there is yeah and plenty of smoke from the other fire which is all adding to the atmosphere <laughs> <laughs> And of course the safety glasses are very important. Yeah, so we're back to... So I have that more or less to the point there. You can see it there drawn to the point. What I want to do is hit the diagonals now. So I go ah, there, yes. there. So now I have... Now if I, that's lost the heat now because I'm only showing you how. Yeah. Now I can take it in the body. If I go and hit that at the tip there, it'll actually fracture it. So it's not hot enough. I need to get it hot. Okay. So we're on, we're on our third heat now. Already? Yes. But you, as you say, oh, you I do that in one. All of that. Oh, in one and one. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. That is the skill and the experience yeah. Correct. At, at play here now. Correct. Yeah. I want to get the tip very hot now because because it was uh, it was pointed without the red heat color. I need to give it a good heat so I can get a nice clean point. If I don't, it'll fracture and I have to cut it back and do it again. All right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That is time lost and Correct. efficiency lost Correct. and everything yeah. else. Yeah. See, I, I, I have a corridor now in the forge itself. Somewhere where I can insert that piece of steel without upsetting the fire. The heart itself is quite tall in the forge, so I've got a good flame, I've got a good fire. Now you can see now that's a good heat there now. And it's got a good length of the heat. I'm using just the edge of the anvil. Just, there's no need for big heavy blows, it's only six mil. Come back a bit on the body, give it a little bit more taper there, it just adds to the first part of the scroll. Oh wow. Now that's, I'm, I'm happy oh, with that. that that's is, a good draw to taper there now. That certainly yeah. is. We, we just show that to the camera. Look at that. Yeah. Look at how quickly that has become like needle pointed almost correct that is fabulous yeah brilliant stuff so that's ready that's now fun. this is where i have to concentrate now because if i don't concentrate the tip has been forged to a point which means the point now is in the forge which will be the first part of the work to go to a mess pretty quickly if i don't watch it you can see it how, how even that's glowing more so than the back of the body there so i want to get that with a little bit more color in it but i gotta watch it I have to keep an eye on that now. If I don't keep an eye on it, I can spoil it and then I can lose it and I start over again. Yeah, so you can see that's coming along nicely. In the next three to five seconds, I'm ready to go. So I basically have my, my anvil ready. That's ready to go. So I'm using the edge of the anvil there, which is a nice uh, shape to it there. So again, I'm not forging, I'm just turning. I'm, I'm shaping it now. Very gentle strokes. Just gentle strokes now is right using the heat that's in the body of the and, 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 and every part of the anvil here just to give me a nice a, a, a build so to speak yeah. now again i've no more heat i need color in that there or i'm going to upset that that's the fine detail that i need that i said to the, that i discussed earlier in the in the in the, in the video i like a nice concentric uh, swan so if i get that wrong i'm into rework and correcting it i'm not happy with that now when i place that into the forge i don't place it on its side because the flame is coming up with such intensity that that little point there will struggle so I got to use the steel there to protect that point there. So I use it there. So the flame is coming around that, and that spine there will protect that that delicate point, that, that delicate part of the scroll. So I go straight into the fire there, and it's, it'll remain pointed up at that there. 
and it'll allow the body of that steel to get hot hot enough so it can for, uh, start forming the, the scroll but without upsetting the finesse of the point you've got a nice draw to taper you want to hold on to that now that's very very important you see the forge now you've got a, the heart of the forge there yeah. what you'll find now is when you have your turn try and avoid looking at it at the forge because what happens there is you carry the flame in your eye to the anvil and all of a sudden you have an uh, arc eye almost going to the, or, or going to the anvil that's ready now for the next part. I've got I've got heat in that body still, so I'm quite happy to, to, to forge away. Now, next heat. I can't do any more with that there. The heat's gone from the steel. If I start striking that, all I'm going to do is add a lot of texture to that. I don't want to do that because I don't want to upset the draw of the taper that I already established. The draw of the taper has been clean, nice clean point. I want to keep it that way. Yeah. If I don't work, th if I work that with no heat, I'm going to make a mess of that with all the taps from the hammer. It's not hot enough. I get it back into the forge. But again, the same concept as before. Don't go into the fire and it's flat either side. Go in straight there so that the back of this, I need that now hot. Aye. That's been worked and that's finished. So that's fine. I need it all hot here so I can start to scroll. Now I'm counting the heats. I think I'm on six or seven heats now. I do that now in two heats. <laughs> yeah, because you get used to it. Yeah, yeah. Well, now I'm poker. Third of the poker. See, I'm all the time tending to the forge because it's opening a, a channel of fire because of the intensity from the source, from the air source. I have to keep an eye on that now. Like I've got a good forge going there, I've got a nice fire. So I'm utilising that there, I'm listening to it, I'm looking at it now and I'm positioning the coals there just to keep it fed. I don't need to come in with a lot of coal, there's no need for it. I can have two parts of coal on that fire to keep me going for the next seven to ten minutes. That's how efficient. It's like sitting in a car. There's no point in putting your foot in the throttle and, uh, and, and flooring it all the way and you're going nowhere. It doesn't make sense. Only when you put in the gear does the throttle become a value because now you're working, you're going somewhere. It's the same with this here. I've got a nice forge going there. I don't need to add any more coal. I can pull in the coal that's just on the outside of there ever so slightly just to keep and maintain that fire. I don't want to reduce it, but I don't need it any hotter either. Not for this stuff. And you can see the colour there. That's quite a really generous oh, wow. there. I have all that there now so I can, I can carry on now. Again, you have to think of uh, if you're in the kitchen and you're making a Swiss roll. You get the, the, you begin to get the roll. Now all the all the heat is gone from that area there. I use my leather to, to point. I need the heat in that area there. The work is done here, yeah. and the scroll is established, so I'm happy with that there. So there's no, no need to worry about that. I need to get the heat between here and here, so I can do and roll that up. Yeah. So again, position that in the fire. Have we got a good fire? just ever so slightly tender for there. There's no need to go and upset too much of that fire. That fire is a good form. So now it's a matter of waiting. And I can count on my head how long it needs to stay there. I know exactly. I can count 15, 20 seconds and I'll be able to take you it out. You do it instinctively. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, well, yeah. you know what the fire is doing and how the fire behaves. And, and there's been often times where the mid flicks has been on of a Monday night and all of a sudden, oh, I forgot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, too distracted to distract each other. Too distracted. <laughs> and next thing you come back and, oh, sugar, we start again. <laughs> so again, it's just a matter of getting that knack now. Do you see the way the roll of that is? It's nice and tight. I've got the heat where I want it, so I might yeah. as well utilise that. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Use the side of the anvil there. So again, me, me hammer isn't marking it. I don't want to mark it. I want to keep it clean. I want to keep it nice and clean. Yeah. But I want a nice concentric scroll. So you can see that Beautiful. there now. It's coming in there nicely. Yeah. So skillful. But it's a feel for it. <laughs> it's a feel for it. And as I said to you before, if we start with Anthony and we say, there's the very first one that Anthony done. Now go and do 60 of them. Do 70 of them. Do 100 of them hang the very first one up in the nail and say that's my very first one now look at the one that you've done three weeks down the road you've reached 100 look yeah. at the difference yeah, yeah. and it's like persevering you know you've got to keep at it don't be frustrated you will be disappointed and it can be very you know annoying but keep at it keep at it keep at it it's like riding a bicycle i could give you a bicycle worth 5,000 euros and you could throw your leg over it down the road you fall over 
but yet you didn't give yourself a chance to just be patient yeah, yeah. give it a chance to to uh, to get you know to learn how Writing to write. is the same yeah I've some awful rubbish <laughs> <laughs> I'm utilizing all the heat now. I can stop there because I don't have the heat there. I need that heat there for all the heat in the scroll. Yeah. But if I keep battering that there, I can lose that concentricity then yeah. and it'll look wrong. And I don't want that. That's that's we me. saw just in a few seconds there, yeah. it went from red hot to orange yeah. hot to, and now it's lost its. But when you, th th there's no light between that there because I've got, I've, I've utilized the heat where I need the heat and I've used the body of the, scro of the, of the scroll to roll up on itself yeah. because it's, it's actually helping me create that because it's all nice and tight. Yeah. So again, I've got a good forge there, but I'll just tidy it up ever so slightly. I'll just bring in that coal there and just give it a little tidy up. There's no need to disturb it because I've got a good throttle there. You can see the you see that part of the forge there yeah. where I've got a really good flame. Yes. That's the heart. That's the real centre. It's, it's the centre piece. Yeah. See that you've got a right good throttle there where you've got a nice air charge coming into the forge there, and your piece, your work piece, is just sitting above that. And again, it's heating it just exactly where you need it. I don't need the heat in the scroll. That scroll is finished now, but yeah. I need the heat there so I can travel a little bit more. So you're putting the scroll beyond the heart correct, of the fire. Correct. 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 And I'm doing, I'm doing it without yeah. looking at it now because I can feel it. I know even by the length of that there sitting on the edge, I know where, where I need to go. We're nearly actually there at the point. Now we'll go a little bit larger swan than I normally do, just for the sake of showing this, the, 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 the scroll working itself. Not hot enough. You're always, it's always easier to check it and be not hot enough than over hot. If it's overheated, it will boil up and will start sparkling. And the, the metal suddenly becomes a liquid and it just disappears and it spoils it. Because at the end of the day, the metal does become a liquid with enough of heat in it. But I don't want it hot at this end. No, it's okay. I'm happy enough. You lift that there now. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But but it's always very good practice to assume it is hot mm. because instinctively you can touch it. You can touch it. All of a sudden, your instinct will don't grasp it too. Tom and Jerry She's moment, fine. you know. <laughs> Now, all I'm doing is just tapping, but I'm hitting it at the 11 o'clock position where I know by striking it there I will get the roll of the scroll nice and tight with that now. So, like I'm nearly there now. I'll go a yeah, little bit more just to give a little fantastic. bit more body. So wonderful to see this up close. There's never a dull day at the forge. Yes. It's always eye opening. It's always <laughs> And he makes it look simple. Well, it's practice. It's practice. It's practice, but it's also skill, you know. There's yeah. definite skill there that, you know, not everybody has skill with their hands, you know. Well, everybody has it, but it just takes more development. Mm. It takes more encouragement. It's like if I give you a, a script of Chinese characters, and you look at it and say, I don't, I don't understand any of this. But yet, if you take it one at a time, and even spend one week just looking at one character, instinctively then you know what it means. So there your learning has started. You've begun the process of decoding all that, and now it makes sense. But it takes effort. It has to take effort. And you only get out of something whatever you put into it. It's like everything in life, you know. Now, I'm in a good heat there. Now I've got a lot of heat there, but I'm not yeah. forging this. All I'm doing is scrolling that. That's hot enough now to, you know, roll naturally with itself there. So I'm not doing any work other yeah. than utilizing the heat of uh, the, the, the steel that's hot there and I will stop there because there's no more heat there such and I don't upset that because all of a sudden I'll have gaps appearing here yeah. and if I start getting gaps there if I start getting gaps around the edge here and I start repairing it although I can repair there all of a sudden it opens up somewhere else uh, and it makes a mess of it then yeah. and then you're back to square one yeah. and I've learned that by doing because you you know yeah, it's you, so learn by learn. Mistakes you learn by the mistakes yeah. what is the stuff that's flaking off the surface it's of the just steel? A, a mill scale while the steel is processed in the steel mill, it goes through a series of rollers. So that, on its last passing, passing through the steel rolls, as that steel is red hot, the scale is formed by the rolling dies because it's got a hot steel going through cold dies and it basically just makes the, like it's all there, you can see it there. Yeah. You can see it there. Flakes it's off. all a flake yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a good forge there. I'm happy with that now. I'll be very happy with that walking, walking with that now. We're nearly there with our swan body. It's not a smoky nose. No, 
but there's more flame. And it it's is. lovely and toasty here right now. Because it is January after it all. Is, it's yeah. not the warmest day in the, in the season. Again, all I'm doing is tapping. I'm, I'm going at that 11 o'clock position there, if you're going to use the clock as a reference, just to tap it ever so slightly forward so we can create